I guess they put me on last to see who the hearty souls were that would remain with me, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Usually when I give this talk to uh, a pure prairie group, I have to wear a raincoat because some rotten tomatoes usually get thrown in me because I talk about cows. But I'm telling you what, I think cows are a missing tool in our toolbox that we don't use as often and effectively as we could. Okay, we're going to talk about uh, using grazing and livestock as a management tool to help us with um, the management of our grasslands. And we're talking primarily about prairies and savannas, although there are many other kinds of grasslands known by all kinds of different names depending on what part of the world you live in. Glades, barrens, balls, all grasslands. So we're going to just talk about them. One thing that's going to kind of be a recurring theme through this whole presentation is that product prairies and savannas and most of our natural grasslands in North America anyway are products of historical and natural disturbance regimes. Now I hear disturbance used most times in a negative connotation. And some of the guys back home call me Mr. D and that's got not called my name is Dan it's because I talk about disturbance all the time. I think it's more important uh, and when I hear these new guys talk about soil health, and one of the five key factors they talk about is minimizing soil disturbance, I just get out my soapbox and I say, that's not the word to use. I don't think we should minimize disturbance. I think we should optimize disturbance because these historical ecosystems evolve under some sort of disturbance. Now we all know that our southern grasslands are really in trouble. They're disappearing at an alarming rate. You heard earlier today, Louisiana's uh, prairies are gone for all intents and purposes. We're not so bad off in Texas. Uh, but in many parts of the world, they're just practically gone. Because of the land use conversion, cropland monocultures of introduced species. And I, I, almost choke up every time I use the word Bermuda grass. I did. It's hard for me to get that out without uh, showing a little bit of angry but, but monocultures of, of introduced forage species are a big cause of the decline of our native pastures and of course development, residential, commercial, industrial development and also the encroachment and invasion of non-native species. Some of those species were picked, put here intentionally and they encroach from the highway right-of-ways bank. You know, the poor old Texas Highway Department in his infinite wisdom decided K.R. Bluestem was the thing to plant. And boy, did they plant it. <laughs> and what they didn't plant, it's taken over everywhere. Of course, Chinese Tower is one you're all familiar with. I want you to read this little quote here. The disappearance of a major natural unit of vegetation from the face of the earth is an event worthy of causing pause and consideration by any nation. Yet so gradually has the prairie been conquered by the breaking plow, the tractor, and the overcrowded herds of man that scant attention has been given to the significance of this end of the land by the course of its destruction. Civilized society is destroying a masterpiece of nature without recording for posterity that which it has destroyed. Now, when do you think that was written? Sounds like something been written a couple of days ago, then, by some environmentalist grass hugger. I'm not a tree hugger; I'm a grass hugger. So I, you know, I can call myself a grass hugger. It was written in 1954 by John Ernest Weaver. It's in the book, The North American Prairie. Do you think John Ernest Weaver was? Do you think he was an early day grass hugger, mm -hmm. tree hugger? No. He's one of the founding fathers of the range management discipline. And uh, Dwayne Rice standing right back there, he and I are products of education in range management. And this was one of the guys that we learned from we didn't know him, 
But this is one of the guys that we learned from back when we were studying. Now, I like this little map right here. This is just a map of the historical occurrence of tall grass prairie. The reason I like it is because it actually includes tall grass prairie in the southeastern states of the United States. I've seen maps of the tall grass prairie they don't come down any further than that. You know, really, the tall grass prairie occurred all along, historically, the Texas coast, over into the coastal prairie of Louisiana, the Blackland Belt of Arkansas, Blackland Belt of Mississippi, only through Alabama, up here in the Tennessee, Kentucky line around the Ken Ross Plain, all over Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, you know, we're not talking about West Texas or the high plains of the Dakota. No, we're talking about some really places that are familiar to you. And this zero in a little bit more on the south where the ferry occurred. This was a master thesis written by a young man named Philip Jarris who went to the University of Georgia and, and in 1997 he did this study. And he identified all these major prairies, plus all these little remnants scattered through the southeast, not only by where they're located, by what the prairies were named. Dwayne and I had a discussion about this earlier today. The names and the individual characteristics of each one of those prairies. It's, it's not good enough just to talk about prairie. We have to talk about what are the specific characteristics each prairie that makes it different from the other. If you're worried about restoring prairies, there's no cookbook. There's no packet of seed you can go and buy from anywhere that's going to meet all your needs for restoring a prairie or a savannah, grassland, anywhere. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this map right here in a little while. But one brick where I worked as a volunteer, I want you to know that, I volunteered with I retired after 40 years with NRCS, and I'm lucky enough not to have to work for a paycheck. The okay, case now I pick up a little extra money somewhere for something, but, but I work two days a week at Britt as a volunteer, as a more or less their grassland specialist. One of the researchers who's affiliated with Brit is Dr. Dwayne Estes out of Austin P. State University in Clarksville, Tennessee. And one of his passions, whoops, one of his passions is identifying and restoring the historical prairies of the Mid-South. And he's gone and identified all of these different types of grasslands, the glades, the barrens, the bogs, the prairies, prairies are all the green, and the savannas, the historicals that occur to the southeast, and he's trying to find them and restore and maintain those that still exist. And then let's focus in a little bit more. And of course, in the purple and the maroon down here, those are the two areas of the coastal prairie where most of the people in this room come from and are, are really most interested in. And then, of course, you've seen other maps of this today. This is the Cajun Prairie, or the coastal prairie here in Louisiana. It runs from about Benton all the way down to Jennings, up to Leo Platte, Appaloosa, Leo Platte, and here's right here, right here. So that's kind of the area that, that is of special interest probably to this conference. Okay, grassland ecosystems. Again, I told you this is going to be a recurring theme. Uh, they are products of historical and natural disturbance regimes. And they evolved with and are perpetuated by natural forces, two of which, two of the most important, were fire and herbivory. <coughs> and those forces, along with all the others, are interconnected and codependent, and they depend on each other to keep these ecosystems in balance. And you need the appropriate amounts of each to do it. Now this map here is a, a compilation of the expeditions and explorations 
by LaSalle in 1683 and Emberville in 1688 and 1699. And they were trying to uh, map the Mississippi, but they were doing explorations all up through the southeast country. Now, when those first people arrived, they entered, entered <coughs> some really wild, wild landscape. But contrary to popular belief, the North American continent wasn't a totally pristine, untouched wilderness. Because it had been grazed and browsed by large herbivores for many, many, many years, centuries, <coughs> millennium, by bison, deer, elk, pronghorn, many other large animals, plus their ancestors, their prehistoric ancestors. So this was not. This was not something that had never been touched. It had also been manipulated, and you've heard earlier today, for many, many centuries by Native Americans. So, let's talk about some of the ecological drivers and natural disturbances, and I'm, I apologize for what happened to my wording here. Uh, I thought it had all worked out. Anyway, uh, and I want you to know that I, I parse words sometimes, because to me, words, and the way they're used and the context in which they're used mean something. And so we're going to talk about ecological drivers and natural disturbance as they are involved in the evolution and maintenance of grassland ecosystems. Again, I, I'm picky when it comes to words. And these are my definitions, so don't blame anybody else. These are my thoughts on what these words mean. To me, a driver is a natural ecological process that's continual and pervasive. So, fire could be a driver. Grazing could be a driver. If climate, soil, poverty, those are other things that are drivers. What are disturbances? Well, they can be natural. Well, they can be anthropogenic. But the difference to me is that these are ecological events. These are intermittent and episodic. They don't, they don't occur continuously and pervasively, and they're not something that is predictable. And the elimination of ecological drivers, or the severe reduction of ecological can be a disturbance. We'll get into that a little later. Okay, to clarify, drivers, climate, fire, animal impacts. And the animal impacts I'm talking about here are deboliation, trampling, defecation, urination, all those things are going to the mineral and uh, cycling, nutrient cycling of the, of the vegetation and the resource. The disturbances, Weather, rather than climate, we're talking about weather. We're talking about individual events that are there. Hurricanes, flooding, drought, those kinds of things. Insects can be a disturbance. Disease, modification, natural processes again. Again, fire can be a disturbance if it's not done properly or if it's not appropriate for the setting and the time. Animal impacts can be a disturbance. But the most negative disturbance I see on a lot of grassland ecosystems is no disturbance. What do you get when you don't have any disturbance on these grassland ecosystems that evolve with fire and grazing? You've seen this picture before? That's what's cool. What is it? Going back. What did I do here, boy? <laughs> give me back, give me back, give me back. Here, help me out. <laughs> give me back to my there. Okay. Uh, so, no disturbance is, it, is itself a disturbance of natural processes that could and should occur on these grassland ecosystems. So, when I talk, when I see people, <coughs> And I worked for a federal agency for 40 years, and, 
and I can take a hit as well as anybody. But when I see people that work for some of these uh, federal agencies that think the only way to preserve and protect the natural ecosystem is to fence it off and to keep every they keep people out if they could. <laughs> you know, they would keep every disturbance or potential disturbance out. And then my thought is what they would have, rather than the natural ecosystems that evolved with disturbance, would be just a mess. Okay, let's talk about fire, one of those ecological drivers. <coughs> Dr. Cecil Frost in North Carolina State did this study, the first approximation of the pre settlement fire regimes that occurred historically across the United States. And as you'll see, has been pointed out earlier, the Gulf Coast of Texas and Louisiana burns every what? One to three years. But look at here. This is a historic grassland prairie called mid and short grass prairie. And all of them burned at least in the four to six years. So prairie, the true prairie is undoubtedly a fire, uh, a product of fire, but I argue it's also a product of grazing. What fire do, we talk about it every day. Moves over, stimulates new growth, controls woody sprouts, sends out drugs to plants, <coughs> maintains diverse habitat plant community, herbaceous habitat plant community. Whether it's in the woodlands or the surroundings, or just on an old open prairie, does it <coughs> What well, about bison? The, the historical grazers we all think about. This is a major conservancy map which was developed to show the location of their properties where bison herd are maintained. And I've been to three of them. Now, I'd like to go to all of them, but I've been to three of them. I really like this tall grass prairie preserve in Pahusa, Oklahoma. I'm going up there in two weeks. Uh, but it also shows the historic range. Now, it doesn't quite get down as far as I really think it did based on some of the readings I've done. And it doesn't mention it all about Florida. And based on the historical accounts I've read, Bison did in fact occur in Florida and in the, the prairies of Louisiana and Texas, the coastal prairies of Louisiana and Texas. So, but it showed it had a wide distribution. So the historic fire and grazing and interaction created shifting mosaics of disturbed and undisturbed lands, and the end of the road was a messy landscape, a really, really messy landscape. And folks, I love messy landscapes. You know, if you had that yard in downtown Houston, <laughs> or a gated community in Houston, your homeowners association would be taking you to court today. What is more beautiful than a front yard like that? I wish I had one, don't you? I love messy landscapes. In fact, I love them so much. I love them in the hottest, driest part of the summer in the coldest, deadest part of the winter. Because to me, that's just an indication of a healthy ecosystem, a cycle of life, <coughs> what we're going to see, the blooming flowers, wonderful, beautiful landscape. In just a few more months, if you're just patient, if you're dealing with prayers, you have to learn to be patient. I love that landscape, too. Now, speaking of late messy landscapes, and prescribed burning, and grazing, this is a burn we did, Britt. Uh, I did this as a training burn for the young ladies that are botanists that I work with at Britt. This was out on the rancher south of Fort Worth in the Blackland, tall grass Blackland Prairie. This particular pasture, about 80 acres, had a whole lot of switchgrass. A lot, a lot of switchgrass. That pasture had been grazed probably for three years. Getting some brush encroachment, that's mesquite. Uh, so anyway, we decided to go ahead and burn it. Before we did, we knew we weren't going to get a solid burn because the worry is where the switchgrass wasn't, wasn't uh, thick. But we also went in and we created some little areas that 
we wanted to maintain the bird habitat, the congressional bird habitat. And we, we went, we got the fire department to come out and sit with us, and we got them to wet this area down. And there's a little fire still burning, still trying to burn in on the edges, but it's not going to go very far. But, and then look at here. What we've done is created a really messy landscape. And we got through, and that's, that's the guy that was our fire boss that day. But when we got through, the rancher was with us, and we had discussed this all beforehand. And he went and got a grip car and started walking around setting all those unburned areas. We said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not what we agreed on. We agreed that we wanted to create this diverse habitat so that your grassland birds and all your other little creatures and mammals, we're going to have plenty of grass for your cow. But we decided we wanted to have some diverse habitat for all the other creatures out here that need something besides fresh, green, tall grass growth. So we created a messy landscape. And I got him to put the drip torch down. <laughs> so. Okay. I'm not going to spend much time on this today because it's already been discussed. But species richness. I don't use that term much. And when I go out to monitor a place, I don't really pay much attention. Because all that tells me is a number of different species that, that occur on a given area. I don't want to know more than that. I don't want to know the relative variability among those species, the kinds, the numbers, the amounts, the proportions in, in which they exist. And I want to know it for the plants, the mammals, the birds, the reptiles, the amphibians, and, and vertebrates that, that we would expect to see on the so the term heterogeneity, which David, my, my good friend, writes it back there from Ragley, Louisiana, David and I had to learn how to pronounce this together, didn't we? <laughs> Have any of you had, ever heard of Dr. Sam Pullendorf at Oklahoma State University? You need to read his work and what he's done with uh, burning and grazing and, and birds, and, and he's really put it all together. Anyway, uh, heterogeneity to me, and my definition, again, I'm good at making up my own definition, is a variability in the habitats and communities across the landscape. In other words, it's kind of a vegetational architecture of that area. So some, of those, some of the factors that are involved in heterogeneity are inherent, like soils, physiographic features, hydrology. We can't change those things. Not easily, anyway. Not, not practically. But most of them are disturbance driven. Species composition, yeah, we can change that. We can manipulate that. The functional and structural groups that occur out there and the vegetative dynamics that occur between those plant species as they form communities. The stature of the vegetation, how high it is, how wide it is, how dense it is. How much foliar cover it provides, how much canopy cover, what the distribution of those plants are, what's the spacing between each plant, are there any gaps, what's the bare ground? Do we need bare ground? Yes, we do. Sure. If we didn't need bare ground, why don't we plant for bluegrass? Yeah. <laughs> we need bare ground. Why do you need bare ground? Ask, ask a mama quail why she needs bare, bare ground for her baby. You gotta have bare ground for seed, you gotta have bare ground for new plants to establish, uh, you gotta have bare ground for all kinds of different uh, animals that, uh, that need it. Biomass, that's another thing you need to be interested in. So heterogeneity, and this is just an artistic uh, uh, description of a black land tree. It's an indicator of ecological dynamics and ecosystem health. And I argue that heterogeneity should be the foundation of all of our ecosystem management and conservation efforts. What we're striving for, when we're talking about prairie management or restoration, is something akin to this. Whether it's coastal prairie, blackland prairie, short grass prairie, I don't care. We're looking for a diverse 
everything from the predators to the historic graves that we don't have them anymore, unfortunately. We have to use cows to minister to have Fire, birds, plants, burrowing animals, invertebrates, whatever, the whole picture. So what is the ultimate objective of grassland management in India? Well, I argue that we can boil it down to just three simple things. It's got to meet the physiological needs of the vegetation, first of all. It's got to meet the nutritional and habitat requirements of the animals. And I don't care if you're talking about bison, and I've learned to say bison because I've got some friends from North Dakota State University, and that's how they do it. They, they don't say bison, they say bison. So, so uh, I don't care if it's bison, or cows, or badgers, or butterflies, or whatever. It's got to meet the nutritional and habitat requirements of those animals. And it's got to meet the goals and objectives of the landowner, or the land manager, or whoever controls that land. And if it fails to do any one of those three things, we have failed. We've not, we've not been able to manage that land as it should be managed if it fails any one of those three things. So, to manage or restore grassland, you've got to know and understand the soil, the plants, the animal. you also got to understand the treatment alternatives that are available to you. What tools do you have in your toolbox? To, uh, to make this work. And you got to consider them all. You can't just say, well, I don't like cows, so I'm not going to consider grazing. There are times you really need to rethink that, if that's your thought. And the management practices that we need to incorporate. So, how many of you are familiar with this website? Those of you that didn't raise your hand, I urge you you become familiar with it. Do you have the Soil Web app on your telephone, on your iPhone? How many of you have that? Just one. I urge you all to get it. You can. I have it on You can get it out. You can press that little soil app. If you add your, your locator system turned on, it tells you what soil you have. Or at least, you know, what, what the soil site description says. It tells you what that site description says. What the name of that soil series is. What the, the surface texture is. What the depth of it is. What the hydrologic characteristics are. Even uh, estimate of the plant community that should be growing there naturally. So it's not perfect, but it's a good start. Early to get to know. No soil, I'm not just talking about knowing the series, I'm talking about knowing where it occurs on the landscape, what the profile is, how much of the different uh, soil textures are included in that, what the soil profile is. This is one of the land prairie soil right close to the Katy, Katy Prairie Conservancy. That's, now let me tell you folks, that's kind of, that looks a whole lot like some of that black land we have up around Fort Worth. Here's the reason you need to know your soil, especially if you're restoring prairie. Say that's a 100 acre plot that you're trying to restore. There are five soil series that occur on this 100 acres. Two of those soil series, and I've forgotten what the series names are, but these are the symbols are heavy, dark, black clay. And they fit together in the black land ecological site. Two of them are fine sandy on and they fit together in a lonely prairie ecological site. One of them is a tight sandy on, which means it has a sandy clay loam soil surface, but about six to eight inches down, there's a tight, tight red clay subsoil. And that affects the root system and the root, rooting capability of the plants you plant out there. So if this is your 100 acres, and 
you want to restore it. And you buy a tall grass prairie mix that's going to do really well on this high, on this tight, tight, tight black clay soil. What do you think it's going to do here? It might do a lot. But what if you buy your, your uh, seeds to work on this sandy oak? And you buy a mixture because the soil of the, the plants are adapted to a, a sandy oak soil, a deep sandy oak soil. What do you think it's going to do here? Here. Not much. You might get a few plants up, but it won't be a good thing. So that's the reason you're making on your soil. You back up. No, no. <laughs> You also need to know your plants, and this is a big, a big uh, complaint of mine, I guess. Uh, when I went to work at Brit, those people know plants a lot better than I'll ever know. They're botanists. But you know what? To identify them, they have to have a full seed head. They have to, it has to be fertile. <coughs> it has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, when do they go out there? They don't just go out there in May when the pretty spring flowers are, are in flush or in October when the warm season grasses are seeded out. They go out there all kinds of years, just like you and I do. So to know these plants, they have to know characteristics of them in the field even when they don't have a seed head on them. I'm going to ask you a few of these. Anybody in the room tell me what that is? Johnson, Why do you know that? White moss, white moss, distinct white raised midrib. It's a wide bladed plant. It's got that distinct wide raised white midrib on the upper, upper side of the leaf. What about this guy right here? Look at that fuzzy, fuzzy, fuzzy stem. Look at that. What is that? We all have it. Broomstick. Yeah. Broomstick. Yeah. Broomstick. What about this guy? Indian Ah! Yeah, Indian Yeah, Look how blue it is. Look at that gunsight leaf. You know, you feel that leaf back. And that gunsight sticks up at you. You can see it every time. I won't, I won't bother you with some of you. That's big blue skin. Look at the hairiness on the upper side of the leaf. What's this? All three of them. She's some gown. What's this? Look how hairy that is. That's just common witch grass. Common witch grass. And this one? Those are pretty nice. Jointed goat grass. You have that? Here's one we talked about earlier today. That's basic grass. Okay. But just the point is, that we need to know our plants, but we need to know more about them than just what the pretty flower looks like and the pretty seed head looks like. And there's any number of resources out there. Some are better than others, some are more scientific than others, some are more user friendly than others. And I don't care which one we use, just use the best that works for you. Uh, I've found this one by Dr. Allen and others. Uh, be very, very helpful to me to ask you to again. This is one by uh, Dr. Schuster that was one of my professors uh, and others about the coast of various grasses. Grasses in Texas. This is my Bible. And it's old, <laughs> but it's still, and a, a lot of the plant names have changed. In general, have been reclassified. I don't think that's what I look for. This is a new version of that by Dr. Shaw and some of the new classifications for genuses of grasses or general grasses, uh, they're still new to me. I'm still trying to learn them. And of course, this was part of our talk when I was back in school, back, just about the time they invented the printing book. <coughs> and then, and then nature are some good uh, wildfire books. <coughs> this book right here is a comprehensive floor of East Texas, printed by the Brit Press, by the way. Oh. 
uh, Barney Lipscomb and Bob O'Kinn and Dr. Diggs. Uh, this is the first fight. It's been out a few years. Volume mm -hmm. two is going to be published next year. We raise the money for that. Volume three will be published as soon as the money can be raised. Each one of these books is about 900 pages long. <laughs> so they're very comprehensive. Yeah, they're thick. Anyway, be looking for volume two. It's coming out. We, they just raised the final amount of money. They just raised two weeks ago. Okay. Besides knowing the plants and what they look like and all that stuff, I also want to encourage you to know before you restore a plant, what's the reference plant community? Dwayne and Billy and, and David Daly and I had a discussion about this at lunch today. You got to know the plant community that you're trying to achieve. You know, what is it that you're using as a reference that you're shooting for? And where do you get that reference? I don't know. You, you have to figure that out. You got to know the functional structural groups you're looking for. The other plant communities, the states and transitions and, and successional stages that might have to evolve out there as you're going through this restoration process. One of the things that, that bothers me the most about Brit is that they have planted prairie behind our building. And first of all, the soil is not natural. That was, that was a parking lot for another building 10 years ago. So that soil has all been brought in from somewhere else. They planted a climax species out there. And very few of them have taken hold. And I tell them, we just need to wait about another 30 to 40 to 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a nice prairie out there, but it looks, looks kind of bad. That's all right. I'm fine. Yeah. Need to know the species composition and the annual production, above ground biomass, and the growth curve. When do they grow? When do they produce seed? When do they uh, first emerge? Need to know the wildlife, of course. Because we're talking about multi habitats and, and to be able to do that with cattle and, and graze the cattle in a manner that we can maintain those habitats for different wildlife species and not be necessarily competitors with them, but facilitators for them in the habitat that they need to survive. They need uh, natural variability of these ecosystems, provides these tremendous. Habitat for all these different types. David, David, here's a quote that David said. I, I hope he takes credit for it. I got it out of a publication that said he said it. <laughs> Endangered species are an indicator of an ecosystem that's in balance. It's important to manage these sites for endangered species because we feel that the land is far more productive, even from a business standpoint. When the ecological processes and all of the components are in place so that ecosystems can function properly. Now that's coming from a cowman. These are the kind of cowman I like working with because they understand the whole system and how the system is supposed to work and how cattle can be an integral, important part of that system. So it's great and good or bad. I bet if I ask each one of the individuals, you would have a firm, committed answer. And I do too. The way I answer the question is great and good or bad? One word. Yes. <laughs> it can be both. Depends on the man. Depends on the decisions that are made by the people and the animals at different levels. Now, these old guys out here had not read the same books or the papers that you and I have read. So their decisions are not based on intellectual. Their decisions are based on where's the easiest place to go, what tastes best today, uh, what's closest to the water, what's closest to the shade. That's how they make their decisions. So it's up to us if we're ha if we're using cattle to mimic what the bison did historically, 
we have to help them make the right decision. Just like you have to help your kids sometimes make the right decisions on <coughs> when to be home at night, how fast to drive the car, what to eat for supper. You have to do the same thing for these guests. Now, this lady right here, she's already decided what plant she wants. And she's already beaten out of the cows to it. So she's made a decision, but she made that decision probably with the help of Mr. Daigle back there, who told her by putting a fence and a, and a watering location in a certain place that this is where she can go today. So he has made that decision, helped her make the right decision. Okay. Stocking rate is the same most important decision a person can make if they decide to use livestock as a man. It should be a conservative stocking rate to begin with because nothing will com compensate for overstocking, especially if it's done on a continual basis. You, you're going to ruin your resources if you continue. It's got to be based on the available and consumable forage that that animal will eat, and it's got to be adjusted to accommodate the needs of wildlife, not only the grazing wildlife. <coughs> the wildlife that are important on that place for their habitat requirements. So fine grazing are essential processes for the maintenance of grasslands. They were historically linked. I'm sorry about the, the wording of it. They, they have traditionally been viewed as separate disturbances. But I argue that they should be considered collectively and not independently. Now, you know, there's a fire. There's a bison grazing after the fire. We don't see this very often. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we probably should. The cow shouldn't be in there the day that this pasture is being burned. But sometimes I think we pull the cows off for too long after we've done the fire. And then that allows some of the weed uh, not not desirable species to establish a foothold when if we turn the cows in a little earlier, they could be eating some of those nutritious weeds that are their first green day. Okay, patch burning coupled with rotational grazing is designed to rotate fine grazing across the landscape uh, over time so you can simulate this mosaic that occurred naturally. And this is just a, a little description of how that might work. This is a currently burned area. As we go up from year one, or less than year one, up to year two, the probability of being selected by grazing animals is pretty good because that's fresh green stuff. The probability of another fire occurring is pretty low because the fuel will be low. As we continue to year two in this transitional state, remember we're talking about a three year average rotation for burning in this country. Still have a lot of bare ground. Still got some pretty fresh grass swimming out there. So it's okay. But after year three, you get some coarse vegetation. Maybe you get another brush encroachment again. And after three years, your grazing drops off because the quality, forage quality of that vegetation is not so good. Probability of fire increases because the fuel is picked up. Now look at here. These are all birds, grassland birds. This is at the Tall Grass Bird Preserve in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And look what the different habitat requirements are for all of these birds. So if we manage just to benefit his low sparrow, what have we done? We hurt these three species uh, and the grasshopper sparrow to a great extent. So you can't you can't manage a piece of land just to benefit one species of animal or plant or anything else. If you do, you're harming all the other species that could and should be there. So the shifting mosaic is something all of us ought to be trying to accomplish. Again, just to reiterate. I love Missy. 
and I think I'll use. I'm going to give you some references. This Reed Nice has been mentioned a couple of times today, and David Day will turn me on to this book right here. And I tell you, it's one of the best books I've ever written. Isn't it, David? Forgotten Grasslands of the South. Especially chapters four and five. And you think, now that's only two chapters in the whole book. Well, the whole book only has five chapters. But it's about, what, 150, 200 pages long. The chapters are long. But boy, they're in depth and they're good. Really, get this book. And I don't get any commission. <laughs> I just think it's a great book and I appreciate David for letting me know about it. Of course, you've seen this one reference many times today, and that's a really neat little publication that Larry Allen put out here at the Wetland Center. Really opened my eyes to a lot of things when I first started working in this country. This is a publication that was recently put out by Dr. Dwayne Nexus, a guy I talked to about the Austin Peace State University that uh, is associated with bread. Unfortunately, he only had the money to get 200 of these printed. He, like every university professor I know, he works on the grants and, and tries to raise money all the time. And I'm asking to help me help Dwayne raise more. This is a tremendous little book. And Dwayne Estes at Austin P. State University, writing. Google, he made it, whatever. Tell him, I support your book and let me know what I can do to help you get some more of these books. You know, you'd think the sponsors like the Tennessee Valley Party, he could have a lot more of these books. And then there's this little book here that, that my buddy David Dale and I put together about prescribed grading as a management tool for wetlands. And it's not just wetlands, it's all native grass. But uh, it, I think it's a pretty little book that explains our argument fairly well. And we had a bunch of generous sponsors that helped us out with that also. Didn't quite pay all of it, but they helped. And we had some of them over there in the lobby of other place if you're interested. Mm -hmm. So before I say what the heart and go back to Texas, uh, uh, I got a few things I, I need to take care of first. <laughs> and, and while I'm doing that, I'm going to sit and Ponder some things, what I've learned today and what I hope to pass on to you. Another quote, John Ernest Weaver. Nature is an open book for those who care to read. Each grass covered hillside is an open book. Uh, on the, and then on each page is written the history of the past, the conditions of the present, and the predictions of the future. And every time I go out to a ranch, or a prayer, this is what I try to keep in mind. What is that land trying to tell me about what's happened to it? Why it's like it is today? And what we can do in the future to maintain it or make it better? Those who don't understand nature are missing the How many of you have seen pictures or landscapes like this? Same soil. It didn't quit raining. It hit that barbed wire fence, didn't it? <laughs> Some happened. And I think it was a grazing animal. But that doesn't mean grazing is bad. That means grazing can be good. But it's got to be managed. I bet you can all identify with some of these quotes. And these are some books. If you haven't read them, I'd encourage you to read. The prairie is embedded permanently beneath my skin. Now I'm from the short grass field. Still prairie. Still pretty. Not as pretty as Indian grass and big boots. We like our side of the And our blue ground. And our buckle. I must confess I have a weakness for empty places. And this land has invested me with its personality. Maybe it's just my contrary nature that makes me love the landscape that's so despised by others. Why in the world would those homeowners association make you mow that pretty tall grass prairie in your front yard? They despise that landscape. I love it. I love it. Okay, farm grazing uh, is both important in establishing and improvement of these diverse habitats. 
can't duplicate what the historical sign and grading were, but we can sure mimic them. And to do to mimic what the Bible did, we have to use that. I submit that fire and grading together are both required to do. I won't read that whole thing, but the last sentence is the most important. Implementing artificial disturbances is essential for maintaining the native floor and fauna of the ocean. We can't depend on the historical anymore. Prescribed grading should be used in conjunction with prescribed fire as a management tool whenever practical and appropriate for the purpose of restoration and management. Thank you. Any questions? Comments? I invite you all to come out to the credit. And Britt, if you haven't ever been to Britt, please come. Yes, ma'am. Um, I've, I've long had a theory, and let's see if you agree with my interpretation. All my life I've heard people say, the buffalo were wonderful for the prairie. Cows, they're all bad for the prairie. And I've often thought, is it that the cows are worse than the buffalo, or is it the fact that the buffalo were free to move, and we put the cows behind fences, and then when we put them behind fences, we do not manage them properly. You're exactly right. We have fragmented this land. You know, what has fragmentation done to fire? We can't allow wildfires to burn anymore because it burns up people's houses. It kills people. It destroys man-made things. So we can't, we can't allow wildfire to occur like it used to. And fragmentation has stopped that. It's all